Hello, and welcome to a very special off-site curator conversation. My name is Rachel Augustuson, Assistant Curator at the Norton Museum of Art. And today we're in downtown Fort Lauderdale at IS Projects, a public access printmaking and book studio. I'm excited to bring us all here today because we'll not only be looking at specific works of art from the Norton's collection, but also the different printing techniques that it took to make those works possible. We'll be considering the special exhibition titled The Collection of Esther M. and Sumner L. Felberg, which is currently on view at the Norton and a show that I helped organize. We'll be using three works from that exhibition to look at three different printing techniques, lithography, relief, and intaglio. For lithography, we'll be considering Jasper John's Targets from 1968 that was made in collaboration with Universal Limited Art Editions, or ULAE. They printed and published that work. We'll also be considering the process of relief, or in this special case, wood cutting, with the work of Robert Mangold. His five color frame from the 1980s is actually a really interesting thing to consider, uh, especially noticing the ancient technique that was used, which originated in China, again, wood cutting. And the last work we'll be considering that'll give us an opportunity to dive into intaglio is the work of David Hockney. His Sunflowers from 1985 will give us a very special glimpse into the mark making process that etching provides. So with that, let's get started. Our partner for today is Ingrid Schindahl. She's the founder of IS Studios, and we're very thankful to be welcomed into her studio today and get a look behind the scenes at how print making really happens. Uh, like me, Ingrid is a Florida native who left the Sunshine State for a little while to pursue her studies before coming back and establishing IS projects in 2014. So Ingrid studied book arts and printmaking at the Maryland Institute College of Art, or MICA. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your professional pursuits before opening IS Studios? I really got my love for collaborative printmaking while at MICA. In my senior year, I worked for Dolphin Press and Print and Globe Collection and Press, mm -hmm. and we collaborated with Trenton Doyle Hancock on poster, a poster project and a fine art project for the Baltimore Museum of Art. And after that, I actually went to David Crute Projects in Johannesburg, South Africa, where I worked as a collaborative book artist and a, an apprentice printer. So I worked on projects with William Kentridge, Senzo Shibangu, and I did a collaborative fine art pop-up book with Stephen Hobbs, which is wow. a really fantastic project there. Oh, that's tremendous. And can you tell us a little bit beyond your professional background, when you established IS Projects, what was the mission that you set out to establish here? So when I moved back to Florida and set up IS Projects, I started it with the mission to instill a love of paper, ink, and craft in current and future generations. And so we do that through uh, residencies, workshops, studio rental, exhibitions, fine art editioning services. Um, and we've been doing that for almost seven years Tremendous. now. Tremendous. And you do a special um, seasonal fair for small printmaking as well, right? Yeah, the Small Press Fair Fort Lauderdale, which takes place the second Saturday of every November here in Fort Lauderdale. We've been running that one for, uh, this will be our sixth year it, in 2021. It's one of my favorites. I, I mean, I, I came here before I even knew who you were to that um, event, that fair, and I really fell in love with it. And the whole fat village community that surrounds you here. And, and something else I wanted to touch on before we jump into the examples from the exhibition, uh, the Felberg Collection. I'm curious if you can give us a little bit of historical background. You know I'm an art history nerd. I know you're a printmaking nerd. So can we dig a little bit into probably the history about the relationship between artists and printmakers and, and what that was about? Yeah, absolutely. So historically, um, printmakers were artisans and not artists. Mm -hmm. So it was their job to bring artists' visions and images uh, into life on paper. Right. So nowadays, printmakers tend to be artists as well. And there are lots of different printmaking studios that work collaboratively um, with artists all over the country. And when I set up the studio here, you know, that was a big part of our long-term goal was to get to a point where we could also be contributing to that rich history and also 
helping the medium to evolve and remain relevant today. Right, and that spirit of collaboration is something I talked about when we were first opening the Feldberg Collection, this idea that artists don't work in a vacuum. There's obviously yeah. people working around them that contribute to their success. And so I'm excited to look at these three examples from the show and the and then getting your expertise and demonstration on how these prints are made, because I think it's a mystifying element for folks. So I think being able to see it firsthand with you here is going to be uh, very informative and I think a little fun. So um, if we, let's get started on that. Sounds great, Beautiful. let's go. So this work is by Jasper Johns. It's titled Targets from 1968. It shows one of his iconic subjects in his oeuvre, the target. And what's interesting is that this is a lithograph with varnish additions. So I'm curious, Ingrid, if you can clue us in a little bit more on what that means when we say lithograph with varnish additions. Yeah, so when you look at this image, you see that there's multiple colors there, which meant it would have been multiple layers of lithographic printing with ink with color in it. And then the varnish additions would have typically been printed afterward to add a little bit of sheen variety. So sometimes they add a, a layer that's slightly glossier, which gives it a little bit more dynamic range in different lighting and from, when viewed from different angles. Well, that makes a lot of sense, actually, when you look closely at that work. So a little bit of background on Jasper Johns. We know he begins gaining notoriety in the 1950s. Just as pop art's really getting its legs about it, Johns is really an outlier of that pop art movement, much like um, his, his collaborator, Robert Rauschenberg. But what he does really on his career is start using these everyday objects, such as the target in this example, to make commentary on the self-referential nature of painting. So he's looking at targets, but also the American flag, numbers, the alphabet. And beyond painting, he applies these objects to, to printmaking. And we know in this example, he's working with Universal Limited Art Editions, or ULAE, to do this print. And it was founded by a special woman, Tatiana Grossman. So can you tell us a little bit about her background, Ingrid? Yeah, Tatiana is an amazing character. Her printmaking career was definitely one of those careers that's written in the stars. She spent the first half of her life fleeing war mm -hmm. from Russia to Japan to Germany to France finally to New York in 1942, where she became the sole provider for her family after her husband suffered like a really severe heart attack. Mm. And so as she finds out that she needs to be the provider for her family, she also finds out she just so happens to have two litho stones in her front yard, a neighbor who's willing to sell a litho press, and a local printer who's willing to teach her how to print, and thus ULAE was born. And so she's working with these artists and she gets to know, um, she gets to know sort of the 1950s uh, emerging abstract expressionist pop art mm -hmm. uh, big names right. um, Grace Hartigan, Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg right. uh, and she continues to work with them throughout her entire life and right. they have this beautiful very fruitful um, collaborative career. So it's really like two generations of artists she's touching on then because if you're looking at Grace Hartigan who's really the end or the mid to end of abstract expressionism and then moving forward to Jasper Johns, Rauschenberg mm -hmm. and many others. Um, it's really interesting to see that divide. But you mentioned something and I just have to ask about it. So Tatiana found lithostones in her front yard. What is that about? Yeah, so that's the sad reality of um, print shops closing. So when litho shops would close, often those stones would be used for masonry, for building houses, for putting paths and gardens. So there's actually a lot of, uh, there's been a bunch of recent uh, examples of litho stones being found buried underground or wow. in basements and, and things like that and sort of being brought back out and brought into life. Well, that's a very interesting element that I had never heard of before. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that part. Mm -hmm. So beyond this idea of everyday objects and even the printer that worked with Johns on this piece, the other thing I wanted to just bring up and, and see if you might have some insight on is the optical illusion that's kind of at play in this work. If you look at the black dot in the center of the top target for 15 seconds, then move your eyes down slowly to the additional black dot in the off-white space below. The green background and orange and pink hued rings will now fill the vacant space as they interplay between your mind, light, and optical illusion. It's kind of a hazy duplication of the target that begins to transfer. 
For some people, even the colors of the rings will switch places. And I'm curious, Ingrid, do you think that the lithographic technique played any part in John's ability to approach this optical illusion? Interestingly enough, color theory is color theory regardless of medium, though lithography does provide really bold, vibrant colors for optimal optical trickery. Well, I'm really interested in seeing how this all works and from our conceptual idea to practice. So can we see a demo? Absolutely. Let's get started. Alrighty, so today we're going to be using a polyester plate to print a lithograph. So this is actually a more modern version of lithography and it but it still uses the basic uh, sort of pillar of lithography which is planographic printing aka no raised or lowered areas and it uses chemistry uh, or specifically the idea that oil and water don't mix to make the imagery so we actually use a laser printer to create this image and uh, for those of you who don't know Toner is actually wax based, so it uses pigment and sort of a waxy substance that then gets heated onto the paper. That's why, you know, hot off the press, <laughs> right? So the, that toner then acts as a base for the ink to stick to. So in litho, we typically use a really, really thin layer of ink because everything's planographic. We're sort of working with really thin layers of everything. So once I've got this laid out, um, I'm going to just double check that my plate here has enough water on it. That's key, right? If this plate dries up, the ink's just going to stick to anywhere on the plate. So um, on this polyester plate, this is a polyester. It has a little bit of a texture to it, so it actually holds that water. And then anywhere where that lacquer or that toner is, the ink will stick to. So it's really subtle. Um, you might honestly not even see the ink going on to here from home. Um, I'm also putting a pretty thin layer on here. With lithos, it's really easy to over ink. And once you over ink, it's really difficult to sort of come back from that. So in a lot of ways, it's actually easier to sort of under ink it first and then build up the ink gradually. So I'm gonna see if I can go for a little bit for broke here. So I like to look at this from a raking light to see the ink on there. I think we've got a bit of ink on there. So I'm going to give it one more wipe just around the edges of the plate. Sometimes the ink can tend to collect there. And since my paper is bigger than my plate, I don't want to end up with any yucky, inky borders. So we're going to give that a try. So this looks like it's inked up nicely. Again, very subtle. Lithography is a subtle practice. So I'm going to go ahead and lay this down uh, in the center of this grid here. It's a little wet on the bottom, which actually helps it stay in place. But Looks great. So then I have my paper soaking. I like to use soaked paper for lithography, but it's not 100% necessary. The nice thing about soaking your paper is that it makes it so the ink actually sits on the surface instead of soaking down into the paper fibers. I'll go ahead and set this down. This paper is at 15. And these blankets, which will help to sort of put down a nice even pressure. You gotta make sure they're all smoothed out. So it's like Princess and the Pea, you don't wanna have any wrinkles in there. Oh, 
looks pretty good. So next we'll look at the work of Robert Mangold and relief printing, which is really an ancient printing technique. Um, so I'm curious, Ingrid, if you can tell us a little bit more about what relief printing means. So relief printing is actually the oldest form of printing, and it's typically made by removing material from a plate, either wood, metal, linoleum, and then applying ink to the surface of the plate that remains in relief, and then transferring the ink to a printing substrate, usually paper, mm -hmm. uh, by pressing those two together. And what you get is your relief print. And wood block, woodcut printing and wood blocks can be as varied as the artists who are carving them and the trees that they're made out of. I can imagine. But the, uh, the concept remains the same, sort of that whole technique there. This print that we're looking at is actually an ukiyo-e print, which comes from the Japanese printing t tradition. And it was made very popular in the West uh, looking at hokusai's prints. Absolutely. I mean, it's something that uh, the Impressionists actually looked at quite, quite a lot, too, for inspiration. And, I, and I'm curious, too, because I know in that special kind of uh, woodblock printing, the inks are rather important. So can you talk a little bit about what was happening in this example? Absolutely. So ukiyo-e printing uses uh, watercolor inks, which allow for those soft gradients and things like that, as opposed to Western printing, which was typically done with oil-based inks. And it's really interesting to see Mangold's sort of American minimalist style interpreted through this really ancient uh, Japanese technique. So this work is titled Five Color Frames, again by Robert Mangold. And this is interesting to me when I consider the woodcut print technique and Mangold really playing up the wood grain, particularly when you look at the very bottom segment of this work. So um, what do you see in that effort? So ukiyo-e printing works really well for playing up the wood grain because the watercolor inks actually absorb differently and release differently in those different densities of wood, aka the grain. So naturally uh, the ink will appear a little bit darker where the ink of is released more and a little bit lighter where the ink is released less. In Western style printing with oil-based inks, this can actually be achieved by adjusting sort of the amount of ink that you're applying to the block as well as the pressure that you're applying when printing. So Robert Mangold's art career, which really began in the mid-1960s, has always considered these classical elements of composition, line, color, shape, and he's approached it in a minimalist style. So it's, seeing this work, I do think it's very representational of his approach to art making. And we know that he worked with Crown Point Press in San Francisco on this. But when we were talking uh, a little bit earlier, we were discussing this idea that Crown Point wasn't necessarily specializing in woodcut. So I'm curious about this particular work, Mangold, and the technique at hand. So. Yeah, so Crown Point Press is actually known for intaglio processes, etching, photogravure, uh, aquatint. And in the 1980s, specifically 82 to 89, they had a program where they were sending their artists overseas to Japan and China mm -hmm. to collaborate with master printers there. This print was printed by Tadashi Toda, who's a master ukiyo-e printer in Japan. And so he would have collaborated with Mangold and probably even carved the plates themselves before printing them, because that's what's standard sort of in that tradition. So with Mangold taking charge of the composition, he would have worked with this master printer to kind of see the work through to fruition. And I think that's a really interesting collaborative process that is worth discussing when we talk about printmaking. And so with all that, it would be excellent to see a woodcut in action. Let's get to it. So today we're gonna to be printing this uh, woodcut I've got here. This is actually on MDF board, which is the slightly more modern material, but the technique and the carving of it is exactly the same as if you're using a birch ply or a soft maple or um, Sheena plywood is actually what's common for ukiyo-e and Japanese style printing. So I have a thicker layer of ink here. You can hear it. It's a little louder, more like sizzling bacon than those baby snakes. So as you can probably tell, this block has been printed before. So that's why the color of the surface is that dark 
black color. Alrighty. So I just want to look at the block, make sure that my ink coverage looks even. So the last example we'll consider tonight is the work of David Hockney. He's a British artist and he's created a beautiful still life called Sunflower 2, dates to 1995. And what's really interesting to me when I look at this piece is you have to get up close because once you look very closely at this particular print, you see a lot of mark making, a lot of cross hatching. So can you tell us a little bit about why we see so much of that in this printing technique? Yeah, so etching is actually a form of intaglio printing. Intaglio comes from the Italian word intaligare, meaning to cut in. So these plates are made by cutting, scratching, or etching into a hard plate, usually a metal plate. And ink is then pressed down into those lines, and we actually print from the recessed areas of the plate. So basically, it's the opposite of relief printing. Exactly. So. Etching is a really great way of capturing Hockney's lines because all that you have to do is scratch with a needle or stylus into a waxy ground that's been hardened onto that plate, and then you dip the metal plate into acid, and anywhere where that ground has been scratched away, acid will eat a line down into the plate. Well, it sounds a little complicated, but <laughs> I completely understand once you ex describe it that way, and I think that would, for, for me, explains perhaps the cross hatching or the mark making, but what about the larger areas of like black swaths? What accounts for that element? So that actually probably would have been achieved through a second etch, which would have used the aqua tinting technique, which is where tiny dots are etched down into the plate very close together, and they hold a rich velvety layer of color. And so that would have been used to create those big uh, brush strokes in this piece. So Hockney's work, I think most people would recognize his very expressive landscapes. He worked outside of the pop art movement, but it is a very expressive approach to his outdoor scenes. And in this still life, I think something that I see reverberating between his approach to printmaking and his paintings is kind of the signature nature of his hand. He has very gestural marks, and I think we see it here in this example as well. And much like the other one, we know the printer in this project, Maurice Payne. So can you tell us a bit about Maurice? Yeah, so Maurice Payne and David Hockney were great friends and collaborators. Um, Hockney drew several portraits of Maurice Payne, and Maurice Payne wound up printing a lot of uh, Hockney's etchings. And Payne was kind of known in the printmaking industry as being quite an innovator, isn't that true? Absolutely. He was an innovator. He was always bringing new techniques to the artists. He uh, pioneered the carborundum printing technique. And much like you know, contemporary printmakers today, we're always trying to expand artist boundaries. But also, uh, one thing that Maurice was great at was expanding printmaking to meet the artists and to, to bring new things to those artists. Well, it's excellent background to hear not only about Maurice's innovation, but also his expertise in etching, which I think we're about to get a demonstration of as well. Yep, we'll take a little look at printing and etching. Alrighty, so next we're gonna print an etching. So this is an etching that I made uh, on a zinc plate. So this metal material is actually zinc. So the lines that you see in this plate were uh, etched in with acid. You can see I have some wider lines on here. This is a little bit wider than you would typically go with line etching. Typically you would use an aquatint to actually make those wider. 
areas of black, but we're gonna see how it prints. I also have some aqua tinted areas on here. You can see these sort of gray areas of the plate. Those are some pretty subtle grays. So we'll see how that prints. I have some black ink ready here. Etchings and intaglio prints are traditionally printed in black. So this plate that I'm printing today actually had uh, at least three or four trips into the acid. So the first one would have been just a line etching to get that initial imagery on there. And then I added an aqua tint to the plate. Aqua tint is a process where you actually use tiny bits of rosin dust and you let them sort of float down onto the plate in this big aqua tint box and uh, then you use a hot plate to bake them onto the plate so they stick onto the plate sort of like nail polish um, and then you block out areas of the plate that you don't want to have a, t a tone on it and then you dip it into the acid and anywhere where that aqua tint where that rosin is uh, it'll make that texture and that texture then makes sort of a a gray tonal range. And so the longer you leave your aqua tint in the acid, the darker and the richer that color field will be. Intaglio is really nice because there are a lot of opportunities for um, reworking the plate. You can scrape, you can burnish, you can open bite, you can put an aqua tint on it. Um, and the way that artists would develop these plates is typically by sort of printing throughout various steps of the process. And so then what you end up with is what's called state proofs. And a state proof is a print that's pulled before the plate is totally finished being worked on. And that's a way for the artist to sort of see what does this plate look like right now. So in this particular plate, I printed a state proof after my first etch and I saw that you know, the line drawing was nice, but it was sort of lacking in depth and texture. And so what I wound up doing was I put the aqua tint on and then I pulled another state proof. And then there was a couple places where the aqua tint was a little bit too strong. So I went back and burnished, pulled another state proof, you know, and that's how that process goes. So that Hockney piece probably has a bunch of state proofs with it as well, which can be really um, collectible or really interesting for people to see because they're a, a direct insight into the process of making of a piece. So the next step, I've got a nice even layer of ink on here and I've made sure that my ink is all the way down into all of those lines. But I'm gonna sort of reassure that using a couple pieces of phone book pages. Phone books are like gold for printmakers. <laughs> we use it for cleaning up, we use it for wiping plates, we use them for all sorts of different things and you know, Phone books aren't really being made all that much anymore. So um, I have a little sort of hoarded supply here. What I'm doing now is just blotting away some of that excess ink on the surface before I start in on proper wiping. So I'm gonna start with a dirty piece of tarlatan. This one's had a lot of ink on it. This is mostly for sort of distributing the ink and pushing it down and pulling away sort of the big blobs. So I make it into a ball that's nice and smooth. That's about the same uh, pressure or consistency as the palm of my hand. So I can go ahead and pick up the plate. We're gonna do nice, even circular motions across the whole plate. I made it to the point where I am done with the Tarlatan, and I'm gonna to switch to a little buff with some more of this uh, phone book paper. Um, and get it stuck. It's a pretty textured plate. All right. So this plate is very, very close. Looks like it may have had just a pinch of corrosion on there. 
and just give it a final nice buffing. So you can see here, the plate, we can see our image, you can see sort of some of these aqua tinted areas. I can also see some speckles on the plate, which may be some of that corrosion. And then I'm gonna put some on the side of my palm here. I'm gonna finish it up with just a little bit of palm wiping. So palm wiping is the process of just giving the plate a final polish with your palm. Got it. So etchings are typically printed with a lot more pressure than woodcuts because you need the paper fibers to go down into those recessed grooves and grab the ink out. It's also always printed with damp paper because the water in the paper fibers allows the fibers to be more malleable and really conform to the plate. Alrighty. So you can see we've got the deboss all the way around. So I always check a corner to make sure that I'm happy with the pressure. And actually this looks really good. So we're gonna go ahead and pull that up. we've got. Wow, that's a fun one. So you can see the areas of the plate that were still that shiny, original zinc, polished zinc, print bright white. You have a lot of control over the thickness of your line with etching because you can make really light, delicate lines by leaving the plate in the acid for, the sh for a short amount of time. And you can make these deeper, darker lines by leaving the plate in the acid for a longer amount of time. So that's why it takes multiple sort of dips into the acid to get the plate fully developed. Well, thank you all for joining us again this evening for this special off-site curators conversation. I know I learned a lot and I hope that you were able to learn a little bit more about the printing techniques that go into making these special works of art. I'd like to extend our hearty thanks to Ingrid Schindel for being our guest expert this evening um, and to IS Projects for hosting us here today. If you're interested in learning more about what they do, visit them at isprojectsfl.com or give them a follow on Instagram at isprojects. If you're interested in learning more about the exhibition we explored today, the collection of Esther M. and Sumner L. Feldberg, feel free to visit the museum if you feel safe. The works are on view through March 28th or you can jump on YouTube and see another curator conversation that I hosted that gives a little bit more context about how this gift came to the Norton. Thank you all again for joining us this evening, and I hope you're well. <laughs>